very differently from we do, and who is not as impressed as we are by those who contribute to the church or anywhere else out of their abundance. God is not impressed by that kind of thing, but rather takes note, as we have in our minds, the widow who came to the temple and she put in her two copper coins. Right? And all those of us who come into the temple and pouring in, you know, they didn't have paper money like we do, pouring in all of these coins, making all that noise as it fell into the temple treasury, attracting all sorts of attention. And God points his disciples to that widow who put in two copper coins, all that she had to live on. And so God takes note of those who give faithfully, those who give cheerfully. Those who give sacrificially out of the little that they have now, all for the service of God's kingdom. So in today's gospel, as Jesus addressed his disciples in the midst of this crowd that followed him, he taught them through this parable that we heard today about money. He taught them about stewardship. And he taught them about the dangers of wealth. So in this parable, we are told that a rich man, he receives these reports that the manager in charge of his property was squandering it. And so he summons this manager and he demands from him, he requires of him an account of all of his dealings. And the rich man, right then and there, if we read it carefully, he informs the manager of the decision which has already been made regarding his future service, he says to him, you can no longer be my manager. He isn't thinking about it. That's already a decision made. You cannot be my manager any longer. And so this manager, or this steward, if you will, in a critical situation, now that he is without a job, he determines very quickly, as the thing on his feet, he determines very quickly what he will do in order to live going forward, how he is going to make ends meet once his position is taken away from him. So he quickly, he quickly summons all of his master's debtors and he reduces the various amounts of the debts that they owe to his master. And when news of this gets back to the master, that is to the rich man, and rather than being angry that he will not receive what is owed to him, he commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. He commended him because he had acted shrewdly. In other words, this dishonest manager, he demonstrated good understanding, he demonstrated good judgment regarding the critical situation that he was now in. And therefore, he acted in a very creative way, in a fitting way, given the circumstances that he was in. Retired Anglican Bishop, Bishop Anti Wright, he makes the following comments about this passage and this unexpected response. I know if that were my voice, that would probably not be the kind of response that I would get. I'm sure the saying is probably so for you. And so he writes that, he says, Jews were forbidden to lend money at interest. A lot of our Muslim brothers and sisters do the same today. They do not lend money with interest. So they were forbidden to lend money at interest. But many people, he says, got around that by lending in kind with oil or with wheat. So we hear about this jar of olive oil. We hear about the wheat. Of course, because these were easy commodities for use at that time. So he says that it is likely that what the steward did was to deduct from the bill the interest that the master had been charging. You follow? He deducted from the bill the interest that the master would have been charging. And so that would then leave just the principal to be paid back. And so the debtors, of course, would have been delighted, but the master would not. And so he says, nevertheless, he couldn't, that is, the rich man, he couldn't openly lay a charge against the steward 
without also owning up to his own shady business practices. Thus, when the master heard about what had happened, he couldn't help but admire this man's clever approach, even though he suffered financially because of it. And so the important point is that what is being commended here, friends, is not dishonest or shady business practices, right? Especially when it comes to our finances, but rather shrewdness. The shrewdness with which this soon-to-be-dismissed steward acted in order to secure his future in the face of this impending crisis that was coming his way. He used his master's wealth in order to make his master's debtors his friends. He used his master's wealth in order to make his master's debtors his friends. And so Jesus said to his disciples, make friends for yourselves by means of dishonest wealth, so that when it is gone, they may welcome you into the eternal homes. What does that mean, Jesus? That sounds very shady. Friends, again, Jesus is not encouraging us as his disciples to try to bring ourselves into favor with others by means of well-gotten dishonesty. That's not what he is encouraging. Rather, dishonest wealth, that is, as it is given to us here, is translated from the Greek word mammonis and from the Aramaic mammon. So we've heard about mammon in the pages of scripture. And it certainly means riches that are regarded as a false object of worship or devotion. That's what the scriptures mean when it speaks of dishonest wealth or man. Riches that are regarded as a false object of worship and devotion. And Jesus' disciples then, just as we do now, they live in a world where many, many persons falsely regard earthly wealth, their earthly possessions, as objects of worship. As objects of devotion, we have only to turn on the television or read the newspapers. Find that right, someone is embezzling, i.e. stealing, from someone else. Right? Or someone has been killed for their money or for their possession. Someone has been robbed. And the list goes on and on because we regard these things, in a sense, as objects of worship and devotion. So Jesus is encouraging his disciples, encouraging all of us to regard our possessions differently. Look at these things differently, friends. Not as objects of worship or devotion, but as instruments. Look at them as tools to make friends for ourselves. In other words, don't use your earthly possessions. Don't use the good time and breath that God has given you. Don't use the talents and the treasures with which God has bestowed to you to try to put others in your debt. You know, sometimes we like to wave our things in others' faces or hold it over others' heads sometimes, or to have others in our debt in some way. We do it with our time all, all the time. Oh, I have served for all these years, now the church holds me something. Really? I have given an X amount, now it is time for me to receive. We can never put God in our debt. But rather, we are called to use these things, this dishonest wealth, if you will, to build relationships with those around us which are based on the divine equity and grace and favor of God. All in service of the kingdom of God, not of ourselves. And so as we think about these things, to consider all that we have received, and the way in which we are called to use these things as stewards, I believe that there are these two important considerations which face us with regards to Jesus' teaching in this parable for today. 
first and most important is that in the matter of our relationship with God, we have all been found wanting. We have all missed the mark. We have all been found to have squandered the good gift of our humanity, live in right relationship with God that was given to us as a gift in creation. We have squandered it. As the letter to Timothy reminds us, Jesus Christ, himself human, is the one mediator between God and humankind who gave himself a ransom for all. We squandered it, but he made it right. And so in him, we are continually called to give an account, just like this steward was. We are continually called to give an account of our lives. But not in the sense of condemnation, as, as I tried to emphasize last week. Not in the sense of condemnation, but in the sense that we may now live our lives shrewdly. We may live our lives shrewdly in response. That we might demonstrate good understanding, good judgment, good action regarding this critical situation of our sin that we once faced. And that we may now take up our cross, that we might now follow him, be changed by him, be saved by him. That's what it means to live truly. And of course, for many Christian faith communities, the second consideration arises from this first one. Once we recognize who we are and whose we are, It then comes from this consideration that arises in those moments when a faith community like ourselves, and like the steward in this passage for today, when we face those critical situations which threaten to place the future of the community in jeopardy in some way. And whenever a faith community faces such critical circumstances, they must consider how they will act, and how they will act shrewdly even now in order to sustain this gospel ministry which we are privileged to participate in, how we will sustain it now going on into the future. Now here at St. Stephen's we have for years, it's nothing new, we have for years faced the challenges of an aging infrastructure. This building in which we worship, the properties which have been restored to us, and the need to address the growing deficiencies as these things age. For years we have faced these challenges. And we need to face them if we are to continue to support the ministry that we are privileged to offer from this place. We have also for years now faced challenges related to our finances. Again, nothing new. We are operating and our building fund expenses often exceed what many are prepared and willing to contribute week by week, month by month, year by year. In years now, we have faced the challenge of finding sufficient numbers of committed volunteers. Those who are willing to take on not just a role, but a leadership role within the various ministries which this parish has to offer. And all of these challenges, I believe, for us have now become critical situations. Not unlike that steward being called in and saying, you know what, you don't have a job anymore. They have now become critical situations in which taking an ostrich approach, you know, the ostrich goes and sits its head in the sand, pretending that the danger is not coming. Taking the ostrich approach is not an option. So I believe that the question before us is this, how might we, as this community of faith, creatively use the earthly wealth and possessions with which we have been entrusted. We don't own it. We 
you have been entrusted with. How may we creatively use those possessions, our time, the God-given breath that we breathe day by day? How may we use our time? How may we use our talents? How may we use our treasures, not to put others in our debt, but to invite them through the ministry that we offer to become friends of Jesus Christ. Because that's what we're here to do, nothing more, nothing else. How may we use these things that God has given to help others to make friends for ourselves, to help them to become friends of Jesus Christ? How might we act truly in faith to serve the purposes of God in this generation? Because it cannot be business as usual. And so I believe it begins with each and every one of us taking a good, hard, sober look at all that we have received. Looking at the breath of life that we are privileged to have that many this day will not. Looking at the gifts and the abilities which we have been bestowed, looking at the material possessions and asking whether with them we are serving the one true God of all creation or are we with these things serving those things themselves? No one can serve two masters. We have to make a choice. They will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. That's why Jesus says you cannot serve God and God. Friends, let's pray. Jesus, Lord and Master of our lives. Teach us and all your people to, to so follow the pattern of your manhood, your godly existence among us, that we may learn to interpret life in, in terms of giving and not getting, in terms of giving and not so much receiving. Help us to be faithful stewards of our time and our talents and all that you have entrusted to us. Help us to buy up every opportunity of serving the needs of others, of serving the needs of this community, of advancing your kingdom in this world and in this place. Lord, we ask these things not for our own.